just getting in. All right. I'll give it a minute. Let folks join. All right. Um, if you would, if you feel like starting, Chuck, I think that we can kind of uh, kick things off. I know Jordan has a bit of material to get through, so um, let me know if you have any questions or anything, and I'll just um, turn my camera off for the time being. Sounds good. Thanks, Brent. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I'm Chuck Clarice with Efficiency Vermont. I'm joined here today with Jordan Engel from the Escala. Um, Jordan will be talking in a few minutes about uh, harmonics related to VFD uh, applications. Um, but I just want to give uh, the audience a, a quick um, reminder that we have uh, a fair bit of uh, information around VFDs on the Efficiency Vermont uh, website. It's efficiencyvermont.com forward slash VFD. Uh, you're looking at the landing page right here. Uh, there's a bit about how VFD works, how BFDs work. There's a video here, and then um, there's a link here to um, rebates that we offer. Um, some of the HVAC applications, about seven different applications, and I'll pull those up here. These seven applications right here for uh, two to 10 and, two, and uh, three to two to 100 horsepower, these are all mail-in rebates uh, for these applications. So if you're so inclined, your customer is so inclined, um, you can go onto the Efficiency Vermont uh, website. You have your invoice for your re uh, for your BFD, and you can submit the rebate right online. Uh, for applications that don't fit into this uh, arena, uh, we handle projects custom. So if you have a VFD application that doesn't quite fit, but uh, you're feeling strongly, will save energy, um, help protect your motor please give us a call, 888-921-5990 uh, is our phone number. Uh, we have plenty of folks here to help you uh, assess if drives are right application for you and um, plenty of uh, uh, technology providers like, like Yaskawa who can help you uh, also with the application. So um, that's all for me. Jordan, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Thanks, Chuck. I'm going to share my screen, everyone. Okay, I cannot start screen share while uh, the other participant is sharing. Okay, all right, we're good now. I'm going to be able to share my screen. Um, so everyone should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation, I hope. We're going to talk about harmonics in HVAC applications and also talk about Yaskawa's ultra low harmonic drive, the Z1000U. So in this presentation, uh, we're gonna cover uh, VFDs and HVAC, some design differences, methods of harmonic mitigation, and the basics around IEEE 519. We're not gonna go into in-depth uh, system design specifics or specific pricing. Our agenda, we'll look at some typical applications. Why do we use drives? Performance characteristics, harmonic performance and mitigation. And we're gonna compare the old IEEE 519 revision with the more current revision. Why do we use drives? Energy efficiency, this is by, uh, by and large uh, reason number one in the, um, Lower right hand corner of the screen, you will see a power versus motor speed uh, graph where we're outlining the amount of power consumed as you speed up a fan, a variable torque load, for example. And you will see that if you take some modest reductions in speed, the energy consumption drops off exponentially. So that's where we get our savings and why we use drives for energy efficiency. 
Also, when you use a drive, you uh, increase uh, mechanical life of the uh, components in your drivetrain because instead of sudden starts and stops, uh, as in starting and stopping a motor across the line, with a VFD, those changes can be set to be quite gradual. You have advanced controls on board most drives, uh, process control, a real-time clock, uh, and other functions. And you have advanced connectivity to different networks that are used in building automation, such as BACnet. And we offer the ability to solve harmonic issues. So here we have supply and return fans, cooling towers. Uh, Chuck covered a couple of these, chilled water pumps. These are all great HVAC drive applications. When we look at drives, some different perform performance factors to consider are efficiency of the drive system, the power factor, the effects on motor bearings, your ability to control the motor, harmonics, and physical size of the drive. So just uh, to, to review, what is a drive? Variable frequency drive is a device that takes a fixed voltage and frequency, typically three phase here in North America, that would be supplied at 60 Hertz and converts it to a, an output to your motor of varying frequency and voltage. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the incoming waveform um, on the left. And then on the opposite side of the arrow to the right, that would be the output of the drive, changing the frequency of that uh, power and the amplitude, which would be the voltage. Uh, drives are referred by a whole uh, a bunch of different names, VFDs, AFDs, variable speed drives, or just as inverters. We're all referring to the same thing. Uh, the one solid condition, however, is that the motor must be a three-phase motor. Drives do not control single-phase motors. We're going to take a look at the overall schematic of what I would consider about 90 to 95% of the drives on the market today, whether they're from Yaskawa or from another manufacturer. In front of you here, uh, every drive has three basic sections. Uh, the first section is on the input, and that is the rectifier that takes your incoming AC voltage and hands it off to the DC bus as a DC voltage. So it takes AC and converts it to DC. So for a 480 volt drive, the incoming RMS voltage is 480 volts. The output to the DC bus would be about 680 volts DC. The DC bus is a storage device uh, consisting of a, an array of capacitors that stores this electrical energy. And the third section is the output section. Uh, it uses IGBTs, which are insulated gate bipolar junction transistors. And the purpose of these components is to take your fixed DC voltage and chop it up into an output to the motor. Uh, so basically you have one pair of IGBTs for each output phase to the motor. And on the lower right hand side of the screen, you will see a sinusoidal smooth wave uh, placed over a square wave output. And basically this square wave output uh, approximates the sinusoidal waveform. So if you were to take the average of these square wave pulses, narrower pulses or lower average voltages, and then you'll see at the uh, middle of the peak of the waveform, the output is wider voltage pulses. Those would amount to higher average voltages. This is how a variable frequency drive creates a varying output voltage to the motor. So when we start talking about power quality concerns, um, we have uh, uh, a couple of different things to consider. Uh, power factor, this is a, 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 a metric that most of us have heard of. Uh, we, we start talking about reactive loads. So induction motors, capacitive loads, these are loads on the system which can reduce the efficiency. On the right hand side, we talk about harmonics. These are a result of nonlinear loads. So things such as battery chargers, uninterruptible power supplies, large LED power supply systems, variable frequency drives, these loads are considered nonlinear and introduced distortion upward upstream of, of in the system. 
and we'll talk about this more in depth. So why does the power factor matter? Um, basically, the power factor is the ratio of real power to total power in the system. So in the um, uh, triangle at the bottom of your screen, the uh, red vector, that is the total power in the system. The green vector at the bottom is the real power. This is the power that actually makes it to and is dissipated at your load. So it's the power that is doing work. The blue vector is uh, the reactive power. This is power that's given to your load but comes back to the source in the system. So it isn't transferred. However, the system still needs to be able to handle the currents that support that power. So in an ideal situation, the power factor angle would be zero which you take the cosine of zero, you're gonna get one. That's a power factor of one, that's unity. Uh, that means that all of your power is making it from the source to the load. Looking at displacement power factor, here we have three graphs uh, in front of us on the screen. The one on the left illustrates a pure resistive load. So think of an electric heater or incandescent lighting. These are very friendly loads because the blue line represents the voltage supplied to the load. The red line represents the current consumed by your load. The green line is the power delivered to your load. That is a product of voltage times current. And as you can see, in a pure resistive uh, circuit with a unity power factor, all of our power is making it to the load. Um, the next two instances are. Uh, extreme cases on both sides of the spectrum. One is a pure inductive load. So an inductor is a device that doesn't like to see changes in current. So voltage in a pure inductor, inductive load would lead current by 90 degrees. And you can see the phase shift on the graph um, where the voltage and the current are 90 degrees out of phase with one another. The resulting power you see is actually going above and below the zero axis. So the power is being delivered to the load and given back and delivered to and given back. In a purely inductive circuit, you are delivering no power to your load. However, your system is still handling all these currents. Uh, capacitive uh, loads are just the opposite. Capacitors don't like changes in voltage. So current leads voltage by 90 degrees in a purely capacitive circuit. And just like with an inductor, in a theoretical sense, no power would be delivered to your load. So um, power factor is an important uh, consideration in terms of how, efficiency, how efficiently your system is delivering power to a load. Now, what I've talked about so far, displacement power factor is probably what most people are thinking of when it comes to discussing power factor. However, the true power factor is the product of your displacement power factor and a distortion power factor. And distortion power factor is what nonlinear loads cause and um, typically isn't in consideration by most parties when discussing power factor. Distortion power factor is caused by something like what you see in front of us on the screen. This would be similar to what you would see if you placed a voltage meter and an ammeter on the input of an AC drive. You would see the red line, the voltage, increase. You would see zero current for a long period of time. And then near the peak of that voltage, you would see a spike of current. And then the same thing would happen on the negative half cycle. Actually, this isn't exactly representative of what would happen with a drive because you would actually see two current spikes, not one. But for simplifying the purposes of the illustration, I've only included one. So if we were to look at this from the perspective of a displacement power factor, even though these current spikes are nowhere near being sinusoidal like the voltage source, you can see they are in phase with the voltage source. So that's why most manufacturers, uh, when it comes to a drive, will say, oh, it has a 0.98 power factor. It is not displacing current and voltage. However, it is distorting the current considerably, which affects the true power factor. So what does this do? What does this nonlinear uh, consumption of current do? 
it generates harmonics. And harmonics were uh, discovered by Joseph Fourier in the 18th century, a French mathematician that was studying thermodynamics. And basically, when you it, what it comes down to is if you have a sinusoidal voltage source and you draw a non-sinusoidal current from it, you're going to generate harmonics. And a harmonic is a higher level frequency uh, that is a multiple of the fundamental frequency. So in the screen in front of you, this was taken from a European source. And in Europe, the electrical distribution system is supplied at 50 hertz instead of 60 hertz. So the mathematic number, uh, numbers shown here are slightly off. Um, in reality, in North America, our power is sourced at 60 hertz. So the harmonics would be multiples of 60. Now, in terms of drives, the even numbered harmonics cancel each other out. And for drives connected to three phase power, not single phase to three phase drives, which is the majority of the installations, uh, the harmonics divisible by three also cancel each other out. So the harmonics that we're concerned about here are typically the fifth, so that would be five times 60 hertz or 300 hertz, the seventh, which is 60 times seven or 420 hertz, the 11th and 13th harmonic. And the 11th is 660, the 13th is 780 hertz. So these four harmonics are being introduced upstream of the drive and they are reactive in nature. These harmonics uh, do not make it to the load delivering power to your load but the system still needs to handle them. So we have these harmonics. What do we do about it? Well, we have uh, a few different uh, options. You can add uh, impedance uh, uh, reactants to a drive in the form of a DC reactor or DC bus choke or a line reactor. These are all very similar components. They're inductive components, so they don't like changes in current. And they amount to what is called a low pass filter. So they want to pass the low frequencies, 60 hertz, into the system and block the higher frequency harmonics. Um, they do have limitations, however. So you have harmonic filters, which are a step up. Those typically are falling out of favor uh, these days. Then you have multi pulse rectifiers. So a multi pulse drive system would be either a 12 or 18 pulse drive that uses additional rectifier units and a phase shifting transformer to reduce these current spikes and thereby reduce harmonic content. Um, 30 years ago, uh, a multi-pulse drive system would be the way, one of the only ways to reduce harmonics in a meaningful fashion. Compared to today's solutions, a good analogy would be um, carbureted gasoline engines versus fuel injected if you're going to compare a multi-pulse drive setup with a more modern technology, which we'll discuss. Next up is the active front end drive. This drive is a drive package where the rectifier, uh, instead of using diodes on the front end of the drive, IGBTs are used, which can interrupt these harmonic currents to some extent. And then lastly, we have a AC to AC drive option, which uh, an example of would be the Yaskawa Z1000U matrix. So let's look at the harmonics performance of these different options. So looking at a standard drive without any mitigation, you will see a total current distortion of about 88%. Excuse me, the waveform going into the drive will have the two spikes on the positive side and negative side of the waveform. And then over uh, slightly left of center of the screen, you will see um, the mapping of the fundamental wave and the harmonics. So to explain this in numeric terms, um, the fundamental is 60 Hertz. That's the energy that will make it to your load and do real work. And then the harmonics start decreasing with orders of uh, magnitude. So you have the fifth harmonic is the largest, the seventh, the 11th, the 13th, and it peters out from there. 88% distortion, basically what that means is that you'll have your fundamental wave plus 88% distorted current in the form of harmonics. So if you have a three horsepower, 480 volt drive, nominal current rating of five amps, you can expect five 
plus 88% or about 4.4 amps for a total of 9.4 amps total. Now the 4.4 amps is reactive in nature, so it, it isn't power lost, but your system upstream of the drive, the conductors, branch circuit protection, and the transformers still have to have the capacity to handle those currents. Next up is a drive with a reactor. So this is adding like a 5% bus choke or a line reactor, and you take your 88% current distortion, knock it down by over half. So you see a significant improvement and you see that the waveform starts to be cleaned up a little bit more to resemble a sinusoidal waveform. Um, so you can add reactants to a drive and Yaskawa's standard HVAC drives all have 5% DC bus chokes as a baseline of mitigation. So, and that is industry standard. So drives from competitors designated for the HVAC market typically have comparable impedance built in. There is a theoretical minimum of 30% distortion by adding impedance alone. So you can only add so many reactors before you get diminishing returns. A multi-pulse drive setup. So like a, an 18 pulse drive would give you the following, which is a six to 12% current distortion and uh, getting a better on the power factor side of things. And then lastly, we have the AC to AC solution from Yaskawa. Um, which is under 5% current distortion, a near unity power factor. And um, the guidance from IEEE 519 indicates a total system distortion, typically of 5% or less. So uh, at the device level, the matrix constitutes an IEEE compliant device. Just gonna go in very briefly on what makes the matrix drive different, how it works, um, so in the upper right-hand side of the screen, you have our standard BFD topology with the six diodes on the front end, the capacitors for the DC bus, and the IGBTs for the output. The harmonics are produced during the conversion from AC to DC, where the voltage is fed from the diodes to the DC bus. Down below is a little bit lighter level diagram of the matrix drive it is completely different than a standard drive. There's no meaningful DC bus. Every motor lead is connected to a power line incoming L1, L2, or L3 by a pair of IGBTs. So whereas a standard drive uses six IGBTs, the matrix uses 18. But by eliminating the DC bus, we eliminate the current spikes, which generate harmonics. How do we do that? Well, the, the drive operates in a highly sophisticated fashion, but it's highly reliable. On this screen, and I'm going to keep rather light to um, the material here because it's quite advanced. On the screen, on the chart below, the, the graph, you this would be a good uh, representation of looking at three phase power. So you have three different phases, L1, L2, and L3, placed over one another so you can see everything all at once. And what you can see is that at any given time during the cycle, during the phase, if you subtract phase one from phase two, phase two from phase three, you can get 480 volts if it's a 480 volt system at any given time. So the drive with all these switches basically does just that. It subtracts phase one from phase two, phase two from phase three, modulates that, to create the desired output voltage and frequency. And so instead of a square waveform, you get a two-step uh, tiered square waveform. The first output pulse is from phase one to phase two, and the next output pulse is the voltage difference from phase two to phase three. So if you look closely, it looks quite different from a standard drive. And this is how in the lower right hand side of your screen, the output would look when placed over the desired sinusoidal output that we're trying to recreate. Now, although when you look up close, this waveform is quite a bit different than a standard drive. If you look from far away on the upper part of the screen, that waveform, which this is an oscilloscope capture of a matrix drive in operation, looks nearly identical to the waveform from any other drive on the market. 
On the bottom half of your screen, we've zoomed in on this waveform and you can actually see from a, uh, an actual measurement, this two-step output that I described in the previous slides. So without using a capacitive DC bus, we generate an acceptable output to your motor and we don't generate harmonics. And because we're using a two-step waveform, we've reduced the DVDT, so that's the voltage change over any given period of time, which reduces noise and reduces ground currents in your motor, which can destroy bearings. So there's a couple of ancillary uh, advantages outside of the primary purpose of the matrix drive. Comparing uh, the matrix to other low harmonic uh, uh, setups, uh, particularly the older multipulse uh, drive setup, um, we're going to look at system efficiency here. So um, on this chart, we have the load. So how, how loaded is your system, which correlates to speed rather uh, closely. And then we have the current distortion introduced upstream. And the blue line is your matrix drive. The black is your 18 pulse. And the yellow is a 12 pulse drive setup. And you can see that the harmonics comparison um, holds up well over the load range. Uh, other setups, as you reduce speed and load, the harmonic content increases. Efficiency, so we're looking at comparing the system efficiency and there will be a visual to uh, back this up in a coming slide. You will see that at max speed, you have your best system efficiency, but as you reduce speed, which is what we typically do in HVAC applications, um, system efficiency declines, the matrix included, but we decline at a lower rate. And again, Another efficiency layout uh, comparing the matrix over an active front end drive setup. And again, this will be uh, backed up with the different system components we'll discuss in the coming slides. So what does a load uh, harmonic drive package constitute? Typically it's a package, not just a product. Uh, except for the matrix. The matrix is just a drive like any other, and it behaves in a low harmonic fashion. If you wanted, for example, a, an active front end drive, you would need the system layout shown on the top of your screen. You have the drive, you have an active front end unit, which connects to the drive's DC bus. The active front end is a IGBT, IGBT package that replaces the diode rectifier. And you need an LCL filter. So an L is an inductor, capacitor, inductor. So you need two inductors and a capacitor on the front end, an LCL filter to make the system work. With the matrix, we have a standard drive package looking just like any other drive on the market, saving space. And additional upstream components like reactors and capacitors dissipate heat. So that contributes to system losses and reductions in efficiency. The multi-pulse setup is the most dramatic. Um, a multi-pulse drive package are very large and contain all kinds of extra hardware. You have to have a phase shifting transformer, reactor, extra diode blocks, and a whole lot of wires to connect all these pieces together. With the matrix, you just simply have a drive module. In fact, uh, a number of customers of ours that have old 18-pulse drive packages in the field simply gut the internals out of those boxes and take a Yaskawa matrix and mount it inside the old drive box and close the door. There's plenty of real estate and the retrofits completed with uh, minimal work. Here's a picture of a 18 pulse drive package with a bypass, which is common in HVAC, 75 horsepower, 480 volt, next to a matrix drive package. So you can see just from a picture, uh, this is at our Oak Creek facility just outside of Milwaukee, um, the size difference between the two options, both low harmonic packages, the matrix on the, on the right hand side, however, is a whole lot smaller and efficient. Matrix drive we have available in the 200 volt class, up to 100 horsepower and in the 400 volt class up to 350 horsepower. And it's also a globally certified product by regulatory standards. 
Now we're going to talk a little bit about IEEE 519. So IEEE is the Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers. Uh, in 1992, they came out with a document uh, addressing harmonics, and it was long and focused on devices, short-term measurements, and the point of common coupling, which is where all your loads connect to a source, was poorly defined. In 2014, the 519 uh, 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 guidance was updated with the revision that shortened it to a 29-page document. Um, the point of common coupling in the system is clearly defined, looks at the whole system, not just at the devices in the system, and focuses on long-term measurements since the load and speed of your drives uh, affect the harmonic performance, they look at a longer period of time when making measurements. So for the 1992 standard, here on the screen in front of you is a one-line diagram. These diagrams outline the power source, distribution transformer, and all the loads on a particular circuit in a facility. And in the 1992 standard, we could have a point of common coupling between a drive in this circuit, between a motor in this circuit, on the low voltage side or high voltage side of the transformer, it was subject to interpretation. In 2014, um, they cleared it up to indicate that the recommended limits in the clause apply at an agreed upon point of common coupling, which is typically the low voltage side of a customer's distribution transformer, and that it shouldn't be applied at a device level basis anywhere else in the system. Now for smaller businesses, we may actually go outside of a physical business because you could have a bank, uh, a small retail store, a clinic, all sharing the low voltage side of a transformer. But typically we're looking at a single transformer inside of a larger facility. So what does IEEE 519 uh, think of drives? Well, variable frequency drives are neither compliant or non-compliant with 519. So you could have a standard drive with no mitigation producing 88% current distortion. And if it's placed into a system with very few nonlinear loads, the averages will work out that IEEE 519 is happy. Um, however, the Z1000U matrix drive, because our harmonic performance is under the 5% current distortion threshold that applies in most cases with 519, you could apply a device level uh, compliance standard on the Z1000U matrix. But the most recent revision of IEEE 519 doesn't indicate that. It does recognize that drives are not the only producers of harmonics in an electrical system. Computer power supplies, uh, LED lighting. Uh, I mean, heck, it's not meaningful, but all of our cell phone chargers and these small little black boxes we plug into the wall are switching power supplies and will produce harmonics, albeit very small amounts of harmonics, they're all contributing harmonics upstream in the electrical system. Um, the purpose of IEEE 519 is to provide some recommended practice and guidance when customers are designing power systems that include nonlinear loads. Uh, if a system is not IEEE 519 compliant, and I know a lot of them aren't, it doesn't necessarily mean things won't work, it just means that it's not set forth in the ideal standards outlined in this, this guidance, although it may not work either. So that's a possibility. Um, so harmonics mitigation, if you have a facility with harmonics, you can mitigate it at the system level or uh, typically at the device level by using low harmonic drives. Um, you can reduce the total har harmonic content in your power distribution system to an acceptable level. So to wrap this up, the analogy, if we look at a punch bowl, so you have the punch, which have that represent all of the power in a, in a facility. Um, and you have on the left-hand side, some uh, alcoholic beverage with a 35% content of alcohol. That, that's like a, 
a drive that isn't low harmonic but has a reactor. So, okay, that's that's strong stuff. And then on the right hand side of the screen, you have loads with a very low alcoholic content. You mix all these together, and it's that average content that um, IEEE 519 is concerned about. And as I indicated earlier, um, the goal for most systems, this doesn't apply to all systems, very large systems could have different, um, a less stringent rating, but 5% current distortion is, is the goal. And uh, there's also a voltage distortion um, uh, limit as well, and that's typically 8% voltage distortion. If you have too much voltage distortion, that's when you will start to see other pieces of equipment begin to misbehave because the power quality delivered to the potentially sensitive equipment would be compromised. Um, so just to wrap up, um, our low harmonic offering has a whole lot of advantages. It's not the only one on the market that, that's a low harmonic drive, but uh, we're definitely equipped to uh, address these applications in the market. And this concludes um, my part of the presentation. If anyone has any questions, um, be more than happy to take some questions on the subject of harmonics. Well, thank you so much for that presentation, Jordan. Um, I certainly want to invite Chuck or John to um, come on screen and ask questions, um, anything that came up um, during the presentation or anything else that Jordan uh, didn't quite address, but um, want to make sure that we hit on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jordan. I really appreciate it. That was very informative. Um, a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, how, how would a customer know that they have a harmonics problem? And and if they suspect they have one, what would be the sort of remedial steps to uh, to fix it? Um, well, you, the, you can look at it from two different ways. Of course, the best way is at the design phase of a facility. Uh, we offer harmonics estimation software. So if a university is going to expand a facility, mm -hmm. uh, the consulting engineer can provide us with a one-line diagram saying, I'm going to have this transformer with specification and all the loads that are on this transformer. I'm gonna have this drive, this drive, this drive, and all these other loads. We can model the expected harmonics performance of that system and mix and match standard drives with matrix drives to find the lowest cost uh, combination of products to still meet the harmonic performance threshold. Now, if you're talking about a facility, um, that's already in existence and they have a harmonics problem, symptoms of a harmonics problem would be um, voltage distortion. So if you have a transformer that's adequately sized for the fundamental load, but you have harmonics on top of that fundamental load and you start to push that transformer into saturation, that's when the voltage gets pulled down and you see voltage distortions. So if you have other equipment that's acting up, and measurements on the, the input of this equipment indicate voltage distortions, then it's um, possibly uh, worthwhile to have a third party come in and do harmonics, harmonics measurements. Um, we have the ability through our free software tool to do harmonics estimation, typically beforehand, but for a problem that's after the fact, usually you need someone to come in with some equipment to, to take a look. Unless you have a one-line diagram that's accurate, then we can map out the loads and tell you, well, yeah, you've got 20% current distortion and 15% voltage distortion. It's no wonder why your sensitive equipment is acting up. That's great to know. Um, uh, one other question. Um, I've heard from a couple colleagues who work in HVAC that anecdotally, I don't think it's widespread, but on smaller horsepower HVAC motors, with drives, um, they're they're burning up the motors, and I don't know if it's related to the drive and harmonics or um, something else. But I have, is that something that is that you're aware of, or is commonplace? Or well, we have to. There's there's a lot of ways you can burn up a motor, yep. and harmonics 
isn't one of them. Harmonics are upstream disturbances introduced by the drive. Um, with motors, you can have common mode voltages. So uh, when you look at a motor and you map out the three phases of the windings, the rotor in the motor is actually like on a Y circuit, your center point neutral. And in a balanced three phase system, your voltage potential between neutral and ground should be zero. Because of the pulse width modulated output of a drive and the fact that there's a little bit of a timing difference, drives produce common mode voltages, which means when connected to a drive, a motor will often have a potential between the rotor and ground. And what will end up happening is that potential will discharge and the nearest spot of a discharge would be in the bearing race. And that's why you can see motors connected to drives uh, have motor bearing issues. Um, now the matrix drive, just by nature of how it works, just as an example, tends to be far more favorable to motor bearings than a standard drive. Um, however, there are cheaper ways to mitigate motor bearing issues. If that happens to be the case, you can get, um, uh, the Aegis is a company that makes uh, grounding rings that actually produce a, a ground on the motor rotor, the shaft, and then have a wire to, to the ground so that these um, common mode voltages are safely dissipated to ground without going through the bearings. Uh, another way motors fail with drives is if you have excessively long motor leads. And what can happen is with long motor leads, you will get voltage reflections that are above the winding resistance uh, rating of the motor. And the voltage reflections will eventually destroy the windings in the motor. For instances with long motor leads, you can add an output reactor. Uh, next step up from that would be a DVDT filter. And then finally, the highest performance option would be a true sine wave filter. Um, so you mentioned small motors burning up drives. When, when I hear small, or I mean, small drives burning up uh, motors, typically smaller drives, and there's some very low cost models on the market, don't have chokes or filters. Mm -hmm. And the output waveform can be such that, yeah, I could see motors failing in certain circumstances. That's uh, great intelligence. I will be sure to share that with our HVAC colleagues. Um, one item that I didn't cover in my presentation is uh, there seems to be some confusion with customers about harmonics and electromagnetic noise inter uh, introduced from drives. They are completely separate subjects. Harmonics are because of the switching from AC to DC, and they're relatively low frequencies, 300 hertz, 420 hertz. If these were produced across a speaker, you and I would hear it as a low frequency tone. Um, customers sometimes have equipment acting up with drives, not because of harmonics, but because of the radio frequency noise introduced by the high speed transistors on the output section. So that's why with drives, you will often see, oh, it includes DC bus chokes, and then it includes something called an EMC, EMI, or RFI filter. That's a completely separate component that's filtering high frequency electromagnetic noise in the radio frequency range. So uh, the best way to give someone an education on radio frequency interference and drives is to find a portable radio, tune it to the AM band, uh, your talk radio or polka music, whatever, and put it next to the drive and then hit run. I guarantee you, you're probably not going to hear whatever program you were trying to tune in. And what happens is, is that radio frequency noise can be conducted upstream into your building's uh, electrical system. So you won't have harmonics and the radio frequency noise won't cause transformer heating. It won't cause loads, excessive loading on your uh, wires and branch circuit protection, but it will create garbage that could affect other uh, uh, sensitive equipment. So drives often have an EMC filter to ground that noise out to prevent it from polluting your building's distribution system. Are these types of filters, uh, can you post installation retrofit a drive with these or do they have to come, you know, sort of factory installed? They are offered, um, again, on our HVAC products from Yaskawa. Uh, the EMC filter is built in as standard, although they are disabled. Um, us, as well as everyone else in the market, 
ships these products typically with the filter disabled. And there's a reason for that. If you have a balanced, grounded, three-phase power source, the filter is a great idea. If you have an older facility with an ungrounded uh, supply or an asymmetrical supply, you can have excessive currents run through these filters and cause them to physically burn up. So you need to know a little bit about your system before you go turning on a filter. Uh, but yeah, it's either included in the drive. If your drive doesn't have one, um, we, as well as a number of other people, sell external EMC filters to place on the input. Great. Thank you. Jordan, this is uh, Jonathan Thibault with Efficiency Vermont. I'm an energy consultant. I just had a quick question. Um, power factor seems to be the hot topic uh, all around the state right now for mm -hmm. a variety of reasons. One being that many of the utilities have either already adopted a 0.95 power factor uh, minimum threshold uh, or they are moving to that. Now that's mm -hmm. quite high and in most cases above the, the natural power factor rating of motors. Um, and then we, when you factor in, you know, the drive and as your presentation pointed out, drives introduce power factor um, harmonics themselves. And even though most of the time these drives advertise themselves as curing power factor, it's again, talking about displacement power factor. So right. when assessing the total package, you know, we're trying to encourage customers to look at how is, do you currently have a power factor problem already? Are you below that 0.95 threshold and is adding this equipment going to solve it or make it worse? Um, in light of that context and with a threshold of 0.9 being, 0.95 being so high, do you, how do you see the two, kind of the two competing technologies here pairing up if we're looking to support new drives at a customer's facility? If given the choice between a matrix drive or given the choice between like a multi-pulse or an active front end drive that would then need additional equipment to reach that same power factor threshold. Right. Well, they, you bring up an excellent question and, and I'll have kind of an answer, but uh, my answer would involve more questions. First of all, what is the standard from the utility? Are they measuring the true power factor or are they only measuring displacement power factor? Um, because you can look and you know, standard drive specification, it says a 0.98 power factor. When you see from my presentation, if there's no harmonics mitigation, the true power factor is like a 0.75. Uh, so I don't know, and I actually haven't gotten into this discussion yet. It brings up, I'll make a note of it. When a, power, when a utility is looking at the power factor for a facility, I would assume that they're looking at the true power factor, but it's possible that they're only looking at displacement power factor. Um, if you're looking at true power factor, then harmonics are taken into consideration and you would need to use a matrix, an active front end, or a multi-pulse drive. Um, I cringe at multi-pulse drives. It's like selling a, a truck from the 1980s. I mean, it'll work, um, but it's old technology and it's only offered because in some cases, specifications dictate 18 pulse or 12 pulse drive packages. We build them. Uh, but we don't want to build them and our competitors don't want to build them either. So with your HVAC drives, for instance, some of these smaller horsepower drives, what would a standard drive look like for like a three horsepower motor that Yaskawa is making right now? Is it more, are you, are you using these matrix drives and those applications as your most popular item or are you still? Um, well, now we have to start, and I said in the presentation, we're not going to get into price, but here we're, we're going to get into price. And the reason is our matrix, um, brand X's active front end, or most definitely anybody's 18 pulse drive package is going to cost at least three to four times the price of a standard drive. And that's especially dramatic when you look at a two or three horsepower drive where the street price is six or $700. You're gonna take that price for an 18 pulse drive at three horsepower, you're gonna be looking at $5,000 because you have to build a great big box. You have to put in switch gear. There's just no way to do it cheaply. Mm -hmm. um, the matrix drive actually starts at seven and a half horsepower. It is often used on smaller motors. Um, 
<clears throat> but for us to, to try and build a low harmonic platform for that small of a motor uh, isn't really worthwhile. And really what it comes down to, you mentioned a two or three horsepower drive, uh, anything beyond bus chokes or, or a line reactor, in my humble opinion, isn't necessary, only because the drive isn't that big. Unless, of course, you have a hundred of them, well, then, you know, that adds up to a meaningful nonlinear load. In fact, with wastewater treatment facilities, they are big on specifications. They have a hard spec. There's no exceptions. And I was involved in a case where a customer demanded a two horsepower, 18 pulse drive package. And I said, first of all, two horsepower is, uh, it isn't that meaningful in terms of the harmonic content being introduced to your electrical system. It doesn't matter. Okay, well, they paid a lot of money for an 18 pulse drive setup. So, you know, some customers ask, well, why isn't every drive sold a matrix drive? Well, it certainly could be. The utilities would love it. Um, but the fact is, it isn't always necessary. Sure. And I guess one more question regarding matrix drives themselves. Um, so I'll often see an application where there's a drive that's connected to multiple motors using okay. the same length, you know, um, lead lines. We know that's that that has to be true. Otherwise, you end up having problems um, in the network. But I'm just curious, is the matrix drive also applicable in an application, a similar application where, say, you have five five horsepower motors connected to a single drive since they all run at the same speed. Is a, could a matrix drive support that configuration as well? Absolutely. Uh, the, the, this application you describe, Jonathan, is typically like a fan array or a fan wall where you have multiple fans all working in the same direction. And instead of supplying five, five, five horsepower drives, um, they'll use a 30 horsepower drive for five, five horsepower motors. Usually you round up when doing multiple motors because there's some additional losses. Um, but yeah, the matrix would work just fine for something like that. Now, the only thing I have to add is that it isn't as simple as just connecting five motors to a larger drive. When you have one drive and one motor, a matrix, a standard Yaskawa or anyone else's drive, you enter the motor nameplate information into the drive. So the drive understands, for example, I'm connected to a motor with a full load rating of five amps. Once you correctly do that, the drive becomes a UL recognized motor overload protection device and protects that motor. Now, when you have a large drive connected to multiple smaller motors, the drive is no longer able to provide protection for individual motors, so you need to add individual motor overload relays to each motor in the system. Um, we do this at the factory with our drive packages. We'll offer what we call a two motor and circuit. So we'll have one drive and in the package, there's connections for two motors and outside of the drive within the package, there will be individual adjustments to set the current for each, uh, the current limit for each motor. Great, thank you. Awesome. Uh, Chuck, any additional questions or thoughts? Uh, no, I, I, this has been fantastic, Jordan. I appreciate the content and also you taking the time to answer our questions here. Um, we are, you know, we're getting very serious about drives in Vermont and, um, you know, the more we can be educated about um, all of these topics and, and the right, app, you know, applications and adoptions of the technology, it's just going to, you know, help Vermont. Uh, absorb more drives, which is our goal. Great. Yeah, I can't thank you enough, Jordan, for your presentation today. Um, it was great to connect uh, and work with you also in earlier this summer. So <laughs> it's nice to have you back. Um, and I guess if there are any additional questions, um, I don't know if you have a contact slide that, that you wanted to uh, put up. No. Um... You can distribute my contact information to anyone that, that wants okay. to. Okay, all right. Folks can reach out to us if they have any questions, and we'll make sure to connect them with you. Uh, thank you so much again, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.